Thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. Normally, I go into, oh, my name is Rick Geddes, by the way. <laughs> I'm a uh, professor in the new Jeb E. Brooks School of Public Policy. Our banner is outside at Cornell University. I'm also a professor of economics at Cornell, a uh, non-resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute since the early 90s. And I usually go into a long discussion thanking the AEI for all, all they've done for me over the decades in terms of supporting uh, my research and so forth. Today I want to make uh, efficient use of our time together because our esteemed guest has a very tight schedule given what's going on in the infrastructure uh, world today. By the way, I'm founding director of the Cornell Program in Infrastructure Policy, or CPIP, and I urge you just to Google CPIP Cornell and you'll see, see what we were doing there in the infrastructure policy space. So I want to get uh, uh, directly to Mayor Mitch Landrew's comments and uh, advice and input as quickly as we can. So I'll do a uh, introduction. Mayor Mitch Landrew is senior advisor to the president and infrastructure implementation coordinator. Mayor Landrew served as the 61st mayor of New Orleans from 2010 to 2018. When he took office, the city was still recovering from Hurricane Katrina and in the middle of the BP oil spill. Under Mayor Landrieu's leadership, New Orleans is widely recognized as one of the nation's great comeback stories. In 2015, Mayor Landrieu was named Public Official of the Year by Governing Magazine, by Governing. And in 2016, he was voted America's top turnaround mayor in a political, Politico survey of mayors. Mayor Landrieu gained national attention for his powerful decision to take down four Confederate monuments in New Orleans, which earned him the prestigious John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award. In his book, In the Shadow of Statues, A White Southerner Confronts History, Mayor Landrieu recounts his personal journey confronting the issue of race and institutional racism in, in America. In 2018, he launched E Pluribus Unum, an initiative in the South created to fulfill America's promise of justice and opportunity for all by breaking down the barriers that divide us by race and class. Prior to serving as mayor, Landrieu served two ter terms as lieutenant governor and 16 years in the state legislature. Regarding education, Mitch holds a BA from Catholic University and JD from Loyola in New Orleans. He and his wife Cheryl live in New Orleans where they raised their five children. I don't know. Amazing you have time for anything else but parenting. <laughs> I have two, and that takes up all my time. Mitch will discuss the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act of 2021, which was passed bipartisanly last November. So Mayor Landrieu, thank you so much for coming. We look forward to your remarks. Yeah, thank you so much. You. It's great to be with you, and, and I want to thank AEI and Cornell for having me here. I never come to AEI without paying homage to my professor, Professor Norm Ornstein, who's been with AEI for a long time. He was actually my college professor and I had the great joy of having lunch with him and, and reacquainting ourselves because we hadn't seen each other for a long time. But one, really one of the great thinkers uh, in American politics and an expert in congressional politics, which we need one right now, obviously. <laughs> um, it's great to be with all of you. The president um, asked me to come up uh, and help implement the infrastructure bill. Um, as you said in my introduction, I was a legislator for 16 years which gave me a, a certain perspective in terms of advocating to the executive branch of government to do and not do things. And I served on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, which was um, you know, the committee on the House side that actually doled out the money for projects. So I had, a, <laughs> I had a little bit of insight there. I later became Lieutenant Governor of the state of Louisiana. Uh, in Louisiana, Lieutenant Governor um, is what I would say a moderately powerful Lieutenant Governor in some states it's a little bit in some states, like in Texas, it's a lot. But I oversaw the Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism, which was the largest uh, industry in the state of Louisiana and really became somewhat of a de facto ambassador for the state in terms of attracting foreign direct investment. And then, as you said, uh, Katrina uh, hit during that period of time. So when I was lieutenant governor, we had Katrina, Rita, Ike, Gustav, the National Recession. And I ran for mayor in 2010 and took office two weeks after the BP oil spill took place. So most of my time as uh, an executive in the city of New Orleans in the state of Louisiana has been responding to disasters, trying to find a way to get the federal, state, and local authorities to get together with the private sector to rebuild catastrophic consequences from either man-made or natural disasters. I say man-made because Katrina was a man-made disaster. Uh, you all watch the hurricane come in and the hurricane come out, but if you know anything about hurricanes, most of the time we have hurricane parties. 
we sit on our porch and we have some wine and some wind comes in and the wind goes out and we dust up the leaves and then we're all fine. There's even a cocktail. But, there's there's even a cocktail hurricane. called the hurricane, which is quite <laughs> deceptive, as many hurricanes are. Uh, but, but from time to time, every 10 years, every 30 years, now much, much more frequently, you get a Betsy, you get a Camille, you get a Katrina, you get a Maria, you, know, you get an Ida, et cetera, et cetera. We're all familiar with, with them now. Um, and there is often catastrophic consequences. When Katrina came in and Katrina went out, it wasn't until after Katrina went out that actually the levees broke. And that's when the catastrophic event in New Orleans happened. That was an infrastructure failure. Mm -hmm. Corps of Engineers had built those levees, designed those levees, engineered those levees, and those levees failed under, under intense pressure. And the city sat with 17 feet of water for, I don't know, a good three or four weeks. If you sat under water for three or four weeks, you get hurt too. Um, and the pressure that it put on the city was dramatic because it basically blew out the sewer and water system. Hence, you're thinking about Flint, you're thinking about Jackson. All of these things had occurred. And my job was to try to help rebuild the city. And it took a huge amount of effort in many, many, many years. And we're still actually going through some of that stuff. But I was able to witness in a fairly uh, personal way how to try to figure out how to put you know, Humpty Dumpty back together again. So when the president said to come up, I was really thrilled to have the opportunity to try to help the country figure out how to do something that we haven't uh, done well together for a long period of time. Of course, there's infrastructure projects going on all over the country um, as we speak, but nothing of this consequence. This is $1.2 trillion. That's a big number. It's a lot of zeros. It's the biggest thing that we've done in terms of direct federal investment since the Eisenhower built uh, the interstate system. And so um, there's quite a lot to do together to figure out how to, what I say, build a mousetrap, find the folks who are supposed to do it, and then figure out how to get it done, and then make sure that whatever comes out of the ground is what we design. And there's a big mouthful there. So we have to really think about what it is that we want to build, where we want to build it, who's going to do it, when it's going to get done by, what we want it to look like, and hope that we come in on time, on task, and on budget. And so my job I'm basically doing three things. I'm putting a team together. Uh, we are getting money out the door, and then we're going to tell the story. And on getting um, the team together, it's not just the federal team, but that's the first team. So all the cabinet departments, the 14 of them, um, have been meeting on a fairly regular basis. We've met 15 times now. And we coordinate the activities so that the private sector doesn't have to go to 15 different places to figure out how to lay high-speed internet, for example. Um, and then I've talked to every governor in the country, and I've asked them on behalf of the president to appoint uh, infrastructure coordinators, which they've done, so they can coordinate their federal, their, their state agencies. And I've talked to most of the mayors through the eight, through the different um, organizations they have, so that we can have a, a horizontal and vertical delivery system on the federal, state, and local level. Because this a project this big, 90% of which, by the way, is going to get built by governors and mayors, not the federal government. We're only going to build about 10% of this stuff. Um, they are the ones on the ground that have the relationships with the private sector. So the secretaries of transportation, so <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, are the ones who actually, in partnership with their governors, are going to do most of um, the work that's coming out of the Department of Transportation. But the quick schematic of this bill is $1.2 trillion to invest in roads, bridges, airports, ports, waterways, build high-speed internet everywhere in the country, clean up the air and clean up the water here, abandoned mine lands, orphan wells, Superfund sites, brownfield sites, clean up the Great Lakes, get rid of the lead in the lead pipes that are, that are poisoning our kids, so that piece. And then finally, building a clean energy economy, which is a thing unto itself, which has been added onto by the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the largest investment of rebuilding climate infrastructure in the United States of America. And so you can imagine all of the players that have to be in the room at 50 different times in 50 different places to start to design what it is that has to come out of the ground. That's the scope of the plan. And just in the last, uh, we're coming up on our one year anniversary um, from signing the bill November 15th. We've pushed $180 billion out of the door already. There are 5,000 projects that are coming out of the ground mm -hmm. in the country. And we're all trying to turbocharge the way we work together so that that can grow exponentially in the years to come. That's great. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we could probably uh, talk all afternoon and evening about uh, everything that's going on with the bill, but let's um, maybe focus on a few key things. So one of the things uh, we're here, and we're an educational institution, is, is uh, public sector capacity. And that is sort of the understanding of public owners, a lot of you said, are state and local mm -hmm. governments, about how the bill works and how they should 
apply for the money, how they should receive the money. How do you think it's going overall? Sort of relative to expectations. In my world, there were enormous expectations when the bill was passed. And, and how is that going given some of these um, capacity issues? Well, first of all, I think the, the first question is what is the expectation? If the expectation is that in a year we were going to rebuild the whole country, that expectation is going to you know, have trouble. <laughs> If the understanding and the expectation is that we haven't been doing this well as a country for a long time and we have to rebuild the mousetrap and get better at building big things again, um, I think it's gone pretty well. I, I do think that as you, as you begin to dig into this thing, um, when, you pressure, when you put pressure into a system, the first thing you see is the holes mm -hmm. in the system. What really do we have the capacity to do? What don't we have the capacity to do? Who's, who's not showing up when they're supposed to show up? What's going to get in your way? What's the SWOT analysis, if you will? The good part of this is this is the first time there's been this much money moving into the system. The second part of it that's really good is we actually have somewhat of a schematic set up, and we have some experience with this. We just haven't done it on this level. So mm -hmm. as a consequence, when you look out over the horizon and you say, what are the challenges are going to be, um, besides the inside the mousetrap kind of things, we noticed pretty early on that we've got, we've got a lot of challenges, but three big ones. And the one that's, that's ubiquitous is workforce. Mm. Uh, you hear this everywhere you go. We don't have enough people to do all of the work that mm. America needs to do. Now, I'm just bragging about my boss for a little bit. Um, Ten million jobs have been created since the president has been in office. The unemployment rate is the lowest it's ever been, and, and, and um, filing for unemployment insurance is the lowest it's ever been. Everybody in America that wants to work right now is working, um, and that's a really good thing. That's a good pro it's a good problem to have as opposed to the other one. But be that as it may, in, in these areas, whether it's we have to lay down 500,000 electrical vehicle charging stations, so we need to train people to do that thing. We have to lay down fiber optic cables, so we need to train people to do that thing. 80% of that is digging, the other 20% is, is the technology piece. So these are new things. We're actually recreating um, the way that we drive by having battery-operated cars. Every major automotive uh, manufacturer in the world has basically said, we're moving into battery-operated vehicles. That's a nice thing to say. And it's wonderful because everybody thinks I'll show up and I'll buy my car and not think about, well, how are we going to get from soup to nuts on where we get the core materials, the critical minerals, who's actually going to process them after they're mined, how are we going to manufacture the component parts and who's going to do it, who's actually going to build the batteries, then actually who's going to put them in the cars and where are the manufacturers going to be that manufacture uh, the vehicles. We're actually going through that um, discussion right now with the private sector to get that done. So that's really important too. But when you lay, when you just kind of step back for a second and ask yourself, is there a ready-made workforce that is, the, that is already trained to do each one of those things? The answer is no, we're going to have to build a plane while we're flying it. So that's the, that's the number one challenge mm -hmm. that we have um, as we go forward. And I have no doubt that we're going to get there. It's just that it's not, it's not like you pass a $1.2 trillion bill and say, all oh, the workers are trained, let's show up and get it done. You've got to design the whole thing. The second thing is, um, because we want to make sure that people don't get left behind. The president's view is that everybody in America has to be included. And you say, well, well, what does that mean? Well, one thing it means is if we push all the money out of the door tomorrow and said the highest bidder and the people that are the most sophisticated, come get your money, all the big cities that have the biggest staffs would come in and they would get everything, and you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't be able to get money, for example, to Lowndes County, Alabama, which is a little bitty town that doesn't have the technical capacity mm -hmm. to maybe know as much or have grant writers or things like that. So getting technical expertise to the ground in communities that have been left out has been critically important. And then the third one that's as near and dear to your heart and all of you in this room is actually how you get permits done to get the work uh, out of the door. And of course, you got federal, state, and local, and all of us are thinking through how do we build faster, but how do we do it with value? and what in the world has been going on and why does it take us so long and cost us so much to do stuff in the United States of America. So I would say those are the three big things. I'm speaking very broadly. There are a thousand different positive things and negative things, but in the broad scheme of things, when you're looking back and saying, how am I going to triage this going out, those are the things that we're spending a huge amount of time trying to figure out with our private sector partners. Great. Th thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Good answer. Um, so I, we're up in Ithaca, New York, in the beautiful Finger Lakes region. Yeah. About an hour and 10, 15 minutes north of us is uh, Syracuse. Yep. And so there's uh, I-81. I've been on it many times. It's an elevated highway that goes through 
Syracuse that's actually an interchange uh, through there for people who haven't been on it. I've actually been below it, underneath of I-81. It's not fun to be underneath it. What, what effects uh, do we expect or are you seeing of the bill for sort of rerouting some of these? My sense is 1956, President Eisenhower, height of the Cold War, the idea was partly defense to create a system of highways for moving military vehicles fast around the United States, which we didn't have prior to that. I think that was in President Eisenhower's vision. And we did it quick, and we did it shallow. Or is not built as deep as the German Autobahn, for example, mm-hmm. won't last as long, we knew that. Um, but we cut through cities, and we, we um, routed a lot of interstate highways in ways we wouldn't do today. So what effects are you seeing now, or do you expect to see, in terms of sort of, now that the system's old, 56 was a long yeah. time ago, yeah. what are you seeing in terms of, and what will we see, in terms of fixing some of that that, if we were to rebuild the interstate highway today, we wouldn't have done it quite that way. Well, you would. One, one of the incredible things about our country is we're, we're constantly reimagining ourselves. We're constantly adapting to new challenges and new opportunities, and and we always have a chance to course correct, which is really kind of great. It's always it's a process of constant and total renewal. So I'm I, I don't want to condemn the entire interstate system. It was a beautiful system. No, I'm not condemning but, it either. But. No, 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 no. I just want to, <laughs> but. Um, and it was built fast, and, it, and, it, and, and in some large measure, it was absolutely necessary. However, I think in looking back on it, I think all of us can agree that we ran through some neighborhoods that we shouldn't have run through. And we never really thought too much about what the consequence was going to be of that design as we played off. And if we had a chance to think about it again, we would think about it differently. And so right now, uh, now that the, many of them are coming of age, and they actually have to be replaced or repaired, some people are thinking about, well, look, why don't we think about reconnecting neighborhoods that had gotten separated. Traditionally, um, African-American neighborhoods or indigenous neighborhoods or poor Hispanic neighborhoods, it actually just were, just somebody just sliced them in half. And as a consequence, there was a, there's a wall. So everybody knows this. If, you, if you're in the South particularly, and I'm sure that's, it's true in, in the North, although y'all blame the South you know, for everything. <laughs> Um, you notice that chip on my shoulder. They blame this out for everything still. Is that, we don't want to go there too much. Is that, <laughs> it's okay. Is, is that if, if you slice a neighborhood in half and you put a wall up, then the folks that, that used to live, they used to be neighbors, they never see each other anymore. And you, and you eviscerate the soul of it, the culture of it, and then it changes it and, and pushes it in a whole new way. And so there's about $4 billion in this bill, actually, $1 billion in the uh, in the infrastructure law and then another in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act whose, whose, whose purpose is to ask cities and states to think about redesigning many of those neighborhoods that have been dissected and put them together, back together economically to grow the economy from the ground up. So mm-hmm. Ithaca's one of them, I-81. I, was, I toured one uh, in Denver the other day on I-70. It's I-70? I-70. Um, and right. it's just an unbelievable, it's unbelievable, because you know your mind goes, they can't really do that. There's only one way to do it is to crash the thing and mess everybody up and nobody can get to work on time. No, we have a lot of really smart you know, architects and engineers right. um, and folks that can actually do this in a beautiful way. And this particular project that's in, uh, on I-70 in Denver is just incredible. It's a, a, a very old Hispanic neighborhood. Um, it was separated by a massive highway. Mm-hmm. Um, it completely destroyed the community. They actually have taken a quarter of a mile of it and actually dug a tunnel underneath it, and uh, they flattened the surface where the cars used to go. They've turned it into an amphitheater, a park, a soccer field, and literally, re- literally reconnected the school where the kids play through the yard with all of the small businesses over here and have increased uh, the private sector investment you know, twofold. And we're repeating that over and over and over again. And so as a mayor of a city, I can tell you how you design the city is going to dictate how people move. Function follows design. And it is absolutely possible in this country to build something beautiful that lifts people up, that actually functions really well, Mm -hmm. that actually, from a national security perspective, would actually take care of the concerns that they had when they built the interstate. So we're just going to get smarter at it and better at it and Mm -hmm. figure out how to make the country more united based on the way we design infrastructure projects across the country. Thank you, Mayor. That's great. One of the things that I've observed in my capacity is, is there's a, what I call a quiet technological revolution going on in infrastructure delivery that doesn't get the headlines of Facebook or Google or these, these big companies. But there's new materials, there's new designs, yeah. there's sensor. It's not like 1956. And, and there's, there's the, a construction site is highly automated today. 
But there's all this, these technologies that are out there that are proven, patented, they're not speculative, that will improve the performance of the infrastructure. They kind of need to be wrapped into the, into the uh, proposal, in, into the delivery of the infrastructure. Are you seeing those technologies ad ad adopted in the projects that you're touring as you go well, around the country? Yeah, the answer is yeah. I think that, again, when I say that we have to get better at this, <clears throat> once, once you have this amount of money flowing down, let, let me just say this opportunity, that people have to actually um, hone their craft. Um, and there's a lot of pressure on them to do it differently. In, in other words, to build with resilience in mind. So, you know, I told you guys I'm from New Orleans. And, um, you know, when the bridges crashed, we didn't put the bridge back the way it was. We built the bridge high. We built it with different material. We built it in a way to beat back. So this idea of resilience is now in everybody's mind. The idea of cybersecurity in everybody's mind. The idea of climate is in everybody's mind. So now it's testing. All the young folks that are, that are graduating in architecture and engineering and product manufacturing, all of those people now have been given license to think outside of the box and to come up with new composite materials, new kinds of cement, new kinds of asphalt. All of those things are happening like exponentially when it never used to happen before because of the plethora of work that's getting done. I just left a meeting uh, at the White House where we actually brought together um, all of the major companies and said, you know, when you're thinking about manufacturing products that are going to be component parts that are going to the EV charging stations, we need you thinking with us from a national security perspective of how we build into this the technology necessary to beat back cybersecurity threats. Right. And that kind of intense designing and communication between the government and the private sector has taken place because we all know that we're in a challenging environment. The same thing is true about rebuilding the electric grid. It's not just about building it back stronger, it's about building it back safer, and that means different materials as well. So there's this huge um, wave of innovation going on you know, all over the country, not only the private sector, but the public sector as well. Mm -hmm. So, so this is great. You, uh, I have to follow up <laughs> uh, because I wrote a book for AEI many years ago on public-private partnerships in uh, transportation infrastructure, but they extend to other types of infrastructure, and I think part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and includes an increase on the cap of private activity bonds that the Treasury can issue up to like 30 billion, I think. So are you seeing as a result of, and there's other things that are in the act, and I'll tell you, <laughs> I tell my class this, the United States is behind other countries in innovating in partnerships between the public sector and the private sector. Many other countries uh, for decades in France, for example, have done uh, partnerships and concessions much more than we have. So I was pleased to see those aspects of the bill. Are you seeing uh, that in, in your uh, tour of, of sites and, and the uh, proposals you're getting from state and local owners about more private, public private cooperation? I, yeah, I, I don't, first of all, there's always a tension uh, in the public sector about how much, how much the private sector is gonna come in and control and or take over, especially when it deals with employees, hours, rights of, of that sort. As you know, this president is the most pro-union president that we've had, and he's really, he's really intent on making sure that in the hiring process, concessions, and all of those things, the public employees are always taken care of uh, in the appropriate way. However, in, in, in my time as mayor and in my observation now, there's almost literally nothing that we do that is not a public-private partnership. Right. It's, just, it's just not possible. When, you, when, when you're building a road, and I say the mayors, are doing, mayors and the governors are doing 90% of this, well, they're, they're letting the contracts. They're overseeing, you know, from a broad perspective, the implementation, but it is the private sector that's actually building the stuff. It's actually the private sector that's contracts. providing the materials. Take something as simple as picking up the garbage. You know, almost in every city in America and every state, the city's the one that lets the contracts, but it's a private sector partner that actually does the work. That's right. going to that's going to continue um, in in every way. In terms of specific concessions or private activity bonds or things of that nature, those models will continue to change mm -hmm. over time. You will always have attention about whether or not you're treating your employees well right. and what's the circumstance. If you have a sewer or water system, for example, and the private sector wants to come over, come into that mm -hmm. and you create a public-private partnership, there are 50 different ways you can do that with just essentially selling it, making a concession, or creating an environment where there's public oversight and the folks that actually get the concession run it with, with public oversight. And you're going to find a different political taste of that different, depending on where you go in the country. But all of those models will continue. And my guess is, if, if we're smart, um, and, and I think we are, 
we ought to always find new ways to do better things to help lift the community up. And there's not a one size that fits all. You'll see what happens in North Dakota is going to be different from what they do in New York. Right. And we want to have enough latitude to where we basically instill the president's values, but simultaneously give people the flexibility to get the job done sooner rather than later. Right. Thank you. We could talk. I think unions should be big supporters of P3s. Building trades would benefit from the increased sure. activity. If we have time, another little uh, shift in gears, sure. uh, so to speak. One of the big Wait, things is if we're okay. One more. I'm getting, I'm getting, the, go. I'm getting I got the, the one finger. One question. One. Here it is. So I, I'm a, one question, short answer. She said, <laughs> "What I am is an old-time regulatory economist. So I've studied electric utilities, postal services, water utilities, and so forth. And there's always this." Bit of a tension, you're probably aware of this in Louisiana, between the urban and the rural populations. Yeah. And a lot of the mega projects are where the populations are, where there's a lot of concentration of people. And, but we don't, as you said, want to leave out any, any groups. So how do you, how do you view, view the bill as dealing with this issue of ensuring that the spending in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act serves rural populations as well as those in well, urban areas. I'm glad you asked me that. First of all, not to contradict you, but the mega projects haven't been awarded yet, so we don't know okay, good. where no. they're going to be. I stand corrected. First of all, <laughs> no, maybe you. not. You, you, you could turn out to be right. right. But secondly, the president has been very explicit about this. We want to see everybody. And there's $14.6 billion in this bill just for rural America. We okay. also have a website, by the way, for anybody that's listening, um, rural.gov, to, to see anything in this bill relating to rural America. One in five um, Americans live in rural America. Uh, they over-index, obviously, rural America for serving in the military. It's critically important. If you're from a city like New Orleans, which is viewed as an urban center, we, we can't survive without the rural parishes providing for us everything that you know about New Orleans, the great food, the great music, <laughs> all the great seafood. Right. Um, there's a symbiotic relationship between rural and urban America that I think some people just kind of gloss over because of the politics of who we happen to vote for. But in terms of delivering goods to the American public, one can't survive without the other. The president really understands this. So he has really instructed us to spend a lot of time on getting into rural America. So Tom Vilsack, who's the Secretary of Agriculture, is our real leader on this, with Deb Holland, who's the Secretary of Interior. And we have made voluminous numbers of trips, especially on high-speed internet, for example, uh, to make sure that there's high-speed internet everywhere in the country, you can't have telemedicine, you can't have precision agriculture without making sure that rural America is keyed into it. On the Roads and Bridges Project, um, we, we, we're going to redo 15,000 of these, and they're called off-system. And they're off-system for a person. They're off of the I-10 system, uh, the interstate system. Mm. They're designed to actually get into rural America and to make sure people's combines can get across, if you were from Louisiana, the bayou, so <laughs> that you don't have to go five miles down and turn around. I mean, that's the, everybody, that's self-explanatory. And then finally, I would say that just to be aware in this instance, that the private sector investment, especially from the automotive companies that are going to be manufacturing, are putting most of their plants in what everybody would say, that their mind would go, oh, that's a red state politically, the way we just define everything in Washington, D.C., which is not the way people define it on the ground. So my guess, my guess is when this thing is said and done, um, a, a fairly significant amount of these investments and the benefits will be both in rural and urban um, because our intent is, as I said, um, to, to function as it's designed, and it's designed to make sure that all of America is united rather than divided. Uh, and I think that you'll see that to be true when all of the spending is said and done. Okay. Out of respect for your schedule, we'll, we'll end there. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. I got to go. That's Thank you so Thank much. You. Great to, great to be with Thank you, everybody. Uh, I think my mic is live. So why don't we go to part two of our infrastructure policy session uh, today, which is our, our panel discussion, uh, which will include uh, discussion of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, parts of that, but also the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which had climate issues involved in there as well. So two acts heavily related to infrastructure uh, passed within a span of 10 months is a pretty amazing development in, in my world. So I'm very pleased that we have a, such a distinguished panel uh, here today to discuss uh, the current policy situation, maybe react to some of Mayor uh, Mitch Landrieu's um, comments. So let me introduce our speakers. Uh, Patrick, I've known for many years and has been a speaker uh, for my uh, program events in New York and so forth. So Patrick Foy has been CEO of ASTM North America since December of 2021. Prior to that, he was chairman and CEO of the MTA in New York 
from April 2019 to, to July 2021. In that role, he led the MTA's response to, the COVID, to COVID-19 and spearheaded an effort to obtain multiple rounds of COVID-19 federal funding, which resulted in obtaining $14.5 billion in federal funds for the MTA. Prior to that, Patrick was executive director of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey from October 2011 to August 2017. In that role, he initiated, structured, and led the largest public-private uh, partnership in U.S. history, which is the renovation of the LaGuardia Airport. He also structured and led a successful public-private partnership transaction for the new Gothels Bridge between Staten Island and New Jersey in 2017, which I had the honor to do a site tour of while it was under construction. I taught at Fordham in the Bronx for 10 years. I like to think of Patrick as one of our products <laughs> from Fordham. Uh, Patrick graduated from Fordham Law with a JD in 1981 and cum laude from Fordham College in 1978 with a focus on history and philosophy. Next is Jim Timon. Um, Mr. Timon is executive director of the Association, American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, ASHTO, and one of uh, his, his uh, lieutenants. Jung Lee is a board member of ours, and thanks to Jung for all his advice and input uh, for the CPIP program at Cornell. ASHTO is a nonprofit, nonpartisan association that supports and represents the interests and missions of state departments of transportation. Jim's experience includes service in key congressional and federal agency roles, as well as nonprofit association management. As ASHTO executive director, Jim oversees a staff of 130 professionals. Prior to his appointment, he was ASHTO's chief operating officer and the director of policy and management from 2013 to 2018. He worked closely with state DOTs in the development of ASHTO's transportation policy positions. Jim graduated from the University of Delaware with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics and Political Science, along with a Master's degree of Public Policy. He's a native of New Jersey, but he lives now uh, with his family in Silver Spring, Maryland. And our third uh, panelist today is Jeff Weiss. And Jeff uh, co-founded Distributed Sun in 2009 and is currently its executive chairman. Distributed Sun helps, helps Fortune 500 companies deploy renewables and is a leading U.S. developer of community CNI and utility scale projects. An early digital media and commerce entrepreneur and investor, Jed led, Jeff led companies in renewable energy, cyber and physical security, intelligence and corporate fraud mitigation, mission preparedness and training, software development and transformational management. Jeff's expertise includes guiding enterprises in the transitional from conventional to renewable power, integrating supply chains to focus on environmental attributes, adopting and investing with environmental, social, and government's impacts. Jeff graduated from Cornell University in 1979. He was Cornell class president for a uh, while for, 19, uh, for the class of 79. He also graduated from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Jeff serves on the trustee council of Cornell and the board, my board, the board of the Cornell Program and in Infrastructure Policy. Uh, so it's great to have such a, a talented and knowledgeable group. Uh, so Patrick, I'll start with you. Uh, there's a lot we could discuss about, about the bills. Uh, maybe you could just give us a little overview of where you think things are with regard to infrastructure policy in the United States, and then we share this interest in public-private partner, public partnerships. So could you talk, and I brought it up with the mayor about public-private cooperation, but take it away. Sure, happy to do it. Uh, the three of us are about to violate one of the rules of show business, which is never follow Mayor Landrieu, yeah. but we're, we're going to do it anyway. Uh, I, I, I want to thank uh, the Cornell Program for Infrastructure Policy and AEI for inviting the, uh, uh, the three of us. <coughs> uh, co a couple of things. One is uh, the infrastructure bill, bipartisan infrastructure bill, is the most money ever spent on infrastructure, even on an inflation uh, adjusted basis ever. That, that's great news because capital uh, investment in infrastructure in the United States has lagged behind not only our competitors, but clearly replacement spending and, and new facilities. That, that, that's terrific. The uh, Mayor Landrieu mentioned, and to me, an amazing thing. In a year, they've put $180 billion to work right. on, on 5,000 so projects. Too. Undoubtedly, some of those were in the pipeline already, but that uh, application of a, such, such a great amount of money is, is, is extraordinary. The, the other thing is there was a White House summit on, on this that Rick and, uh, and I and lots of 
Jim and Jeff looked at, uh, and, and there, there are a number of things they're looking at, but one in particular I think is extraordinarily important, which is workforce development, right? Uh, infrastructure jobs uh, aren't jobs, they're careers, right? They're high paying jobs with quality benefits and frankly the opportunity to have a lifetime uh, a job and a job in which challenges uh, increase. And, and it's not only construction, it, it's technology, uh, it, it's cyber, uh, and it, it, it frankly covers a broad spectrum of the, uh, of the U.S. economy. So the workforce development, obviously the workplace in the United States and around the world is in turmoil because of, uh, of the pandemic and a national focus on getting people back to work, making sure it's done on a diverse and equitable basis is, is extraordinary. From a P3 point of view, Rick, I, I'd note the following, that at the White House summit last week, the Assistant Secretary from the Army Corps of Engineers was one of the presenters, and, and they talked about a large P3, not quite as large as uh, LaGuardia, which I'm proud of, and hopefully everybody in the room has been in the, uh, in the new LaGuardia, and I, I, I hope you like it. But it's a flood mitigation program in uh, Minnesota and, and North Dakota. It's called Fargo-Moorhead. It's about a $3 billion deal, 2.9, but who's counting? Uh, and the federal government has just put an additional $700 million uh, into it. Uh, it's the first P3 that the Army Corps of Engineers is, uh, is pursuing. Uh, and the Assistant Secretary from the Army Corps of Engineers was the presenter at the White House Summit uh, last, uh, last week. The, the other thing I just want to talk about is, is LaGuardia, which is a project that my team and I at the Port Authority did as a P3. Uh, John Picari, who was uh, one of the presenters last week, is President Biden, was pri President Biden's uh, envoy uh, dealing with the port congestion, uh, you know, ships from, uh, from China and uh, other places being stuck outside Los Angeles uh, and, and Long Beach. Uh, and, and John described LaGuardia P3 as a national model, and, and I think that's right. And, and why, why do I say that? One is it, it's an extraordinary result, result for the public. Uh, there are 50,000 passengers who go through LaGuardia uh, every day. LaGuardia is a very, very small piece of uh, real estate. I grew up about a, a mile from it, and it's kind of loomed in my uh, life as a, uh, you know, as a public facility for a, for a long period of time. Uh, so a, a, a great result. Uh, the, uh, lots of uh, innovation. Uh, for instance, uh, if you've been to LaGuardia, you'll see that there are raised fingers that you walk over that allow planes to circulate un underneath. And, and what that did is it increased by about 40 or 50 percent the amount of airside land without adding an additional foot or spending an additional dollar uh, adding, and, and LaGuardia is a very small footprint. The other thing is the P T P3 team took the risk of delivery and, and budget and had the, had the project gone over, it, it would have, uh, their equity would have been diminished and, and worst case w wiped out. So the innovation that was delivered, the service to the public that was delivered, uh, and, and the job was on, was on time, oddly enough or perversely enough, the pandemic helped by reducing for periods of time the number of customers going through LaGuardia. It went from 50,000 to a significantly low number. Now it's back at the 50,000 uh, level. And the uh, infrastructure bill is set up to encourage and accelerate PABs and TIFIA, uh, the TIFIA project eligible cost has been raised to 49% for transit and transit-oriented development. And all those things, in addition to the, uh, the grant money that the, uh, the mayor referred to, should be positive for P3 transactions and those done in a traditional way. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patrick. Sure. Um, there's a lot there we'll, maybe we'll come back to sure. <laughs> on uh, public-private cooperation. But, Jim, why don't we... Go to you. If you could give the, the state DOT perspective, but don't feel compelled to limit yourself sure. to that. I know we're all in this world for our careers, as, as Patrick says. Um, so uh, tell, us, tell us what you're seeing, but also uh, your thoughts on where we are uh, with regard to both, both bills and uh, what you see for the future. Well, as the mayor said, and, and as Pat just said, I mean, this is, you know, the largest infrastructure bill that the federal government has ever done. I mean, and this is just a great opportunity for us across the country, not just in transportation, but in other sectors of infrastructure as well. Um, you know, one of the things that I guess I wanted to start with was really how this bill came together, because I think it's an important story to tell for what it means for people uh, out there across the country. 
Uh, a lot of folks like to say that you know, Washington is broken, right? That, that Congress is broken, the executive branch is broken, and the courts are broken. Uh, but when you really look at this, this bill, I think there's some hope for people in how it came together. <laughs> right. uh, it's one of the few bipartisan bills that was put together here over the last several years. And as a result, I think it has a great balance for what it's going to be able to deliver for the American people. Uh, it, it addresses a lot of the emerging priorities that are out there from a, from a resilience standpoint, from a climate change standpoint. Uh, but it also invests in a lot of the traditional programs and priorities that the country still needs us to invest in. And without the president going out there and reaching across the aisle and finding a group of, of bipartisan senators to be able to work with to put this together, I don't know if this bill gets across the finish line a year ago the way that it did. Uh, so I got to give everybody a lot of credit for seeing the forest through the trees here, being able to work together uh, and to get this bill done. I know where it's, it's been a year now since the bill has passed, and, and not a lot, of, a lot of folks are talking about how it came together. Mm. But I think it's an important story for us to continue to tell, because I think that's the way we kind of get back to the way we used to be in right. getting things done. Right. Uh, working across the aisle, working in a bipartisan manner, having the White House be willing to, to reach out. Uh, to the other side of the aisle and say, let's find a way to get things done. That used to happen a lot more than it's happened now. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of people out there this month campaigning on what happened with this bill, because it's something that everybody can relate to, and it's an accomplishment that a lot of folks can claim credit for. From a state DOT perspective, I think that's one of the reasons that you see a lot of state DOTs excited about this bill, is that it has something in it for nearly every state in the country, for every state in the country, really. Uh, whether you're a, a fast-growing state that's dealing with uh, an in, uh, population growth and, and a lot of infrastructure challenges, mm -hmm. there's money in this bill for, for you. If you're one of those states and maybe the Northeast that uh, built out a lot of your infrastructure years ago and are more concerned with asset management, mm -hmm. there's a lot of funding in here for you as well. Uh, if you're a, a, a state that's really dealing with issues associated with climate change and resilience. There's funding and programs in this bill for you as well. So it really addresses a lot of the priorities that people see across the political spectrum, and it's going to help us address some of the transportation infrastructure issues that we've been dealing with or concerned about for a number of years. So there's a lot of excitement in the state DOT community for it. Uh, we just got back from our AASHTO annual meeting in, in, uh, in Orlando this year, uh, brought in a, a new president, Roger Millar, who's mm. from the Washington State DOT. Mm -hmm. And his emphasis areas this year are, are really around resilience and, and focusing on building a, a smart, safe, and a sound transportation system, mm -hmm. making sure that we're using technology in everything that we do to better operate the existing transportation network that we have, making sure that we're investing in all modes of transportation, mm -hmm. transit, rail, active transportation, uh, making sure that we're taking care of the assets that we have from an asset management standpoint uh, so that we can uh, withstand the, the changes that we're seeing from a climate standpoint, uh, making sure that, that we're doing things in a in a way that is innovative and, and looking at things from a technology standpoint that maybe that we haven't uh, utilized in the past in, in transportation. So, uh, you know, we think this bill actually provides a great foundation and a platform for us to be able to build a safe, sound, and a smart transportation system so that it can be resilient for generations to come. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. We, that stimulates a lot, a lot of thoughts, but uh, why don't uh, we go to Jeff Weiss? Um, who is uh, more on the renewables uh, and climate side of things, Jeff. So uh, give us your thoughts. You and I discussed this. Jim was up for my board meeting last week uh, to, to Cornell's campus in Ithaca. So we had a chance to discuss this one-on-one -on -one then about uh, the solar panel uh, development and so forth. But give us your, your – you're in a, a bit of a different uh, uh, sector of the infrastructure world. So can you give us your, your perspective? Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and, and Rich, thank you for having me. Thank you, um, CPIP and um, the American Enterprise Institute. I'm really honored to be here and honored to follow the mayor and to um, be with uh, Jim and Pat. So thank, thank you so much. So I represent uh, the, a form of infrastructure called energy. 
So in the world that we all live in, there's a large set of infrastructure, which is all the energy that powers everything that we do. And I'm going to talk for a couple minutes just about markets, rocket fuel, and implementation. And I'm going to frame it in three numbers, 2, 3, and 10. So, there, so those are the takeaways, 2, 3, and 10. And I'll, and I'll tell you what I mean uh, by that. Um, the first one, too, has to do with the fact that from a market's point of view, we are now moving, we have moved, from the 20th century to the 21st century. So in the 20th century, we created all of the infrastructure to power everything we do. We created the electric grid, and we created all the infrastructure that powers all of our transportation. And most people know sort of kind of how that works. In the 21st century, we're changing all that, and we're changing all it in material ways as we go from the century that was based on carbon to the century that's based on what is true. And I'm going to define true, um, which I spell T-R-U. Um, and it's all driven uh, by people's preferences and demand. It's driven by preferences for saving the planet and living in a place that is low carbon. So the number two is the driving factor behind the markets because of the opportunity it creates. In the 20th century, we had distinct electricity markets and transportation markets. In the 21st century, those two markets are increasingly integrated. They're integrated because the form of transportation is powered by electricity and batteries and instead of by internal combustion engines. And as we make that transition, the number two comes in because we have to double the size of our grid. We literally have to double the size of our grid. So that's the first number, which is two. In doubling the size of your grid, you have the opportunity to reinvent the technology. And that's what we have to do. And these two acts, the, the IRA and the infrastructure law, give us a lot of the money to underpin that. The markets are driven, in true, uh, by customers. The markets are driven by keeping customers for enterprises, by satisfying employees, by benefiting communities, by increasing profits, and improving stock market performance. Now, who doesn't want all those things? It's kind of like, it's kind of like chocolate. It's delicious. But it's like fat-free chocolate because you get to enjoy it and, it, and it's uh, good for you. So as we look at greenhouse gas mitigation and we look at scope one and scope two, it's really important to take a systems approach, which, and that's all of what we're doing um, and that, how markets are driving. The laws are fantastic because they're giving us rocket fuel. And the rocket fuel is critically important to accelerate the transition. It can't happen without it. And America doesn't have industrial policy. And this is the first time that we've used a market approach to, to put a lot of money in behind change and the change is all happening at a local level. We already have a lot going on in the capital markets about what's called ESG. We have standards, uh, SBTI, science-based approaches. The SEC, the Securities and, Ex and Ex Securities and Exchange Commission is behind this. As a society, we care a lot about resilience. We care about uh, generation. And we care about making everything bi-directional, uh, grid local, co-generated and industrial. But we have to figure out how to do that. So that's where, the, that's where true comes in. So in the world of carbon, we really didn't care where it came from. What we cared about was the accessibility, and we created as a society a hub and spoke system. We had plants over there. We had people in communities over here. And we created transmission lines and other forms of pipelines to move from A to B. And that, that worked really well, and we built a really large society on that premise in the 20th century. But everyone who knows anything about systems knows that hub-and-spoke systems are inherently not resilient and are weak. And a better system is a, is, a, is a mesh network or a grid system. And now we have the opportunity to reinvent and redeploy because, of, because we're doubling. Um, and we need, we, it gives us the opportunity to actually know our electrons. Because our electrons are now what's powering the lights around us and they're powering our transportation and our airplanes. And over the course of this century, it's a century of true electrons, which are going to be true current. Um, so true current is a critical concept for the century, which underpins the infrastructure law and the IRA and how money's going to be deployed. And as a, as a professional commercial, I'll, I'll, I'll share that true current is a brand that my company is 
um, is, 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 is using and is uh, deploying uh, in, in the world. Um, as this all happens, as this all happens, implementation is really important. And this is where the three and the 10 are gonna come in. I talked about two, three, and 10. So in implementation, doing everything that needs to be done is really hard. It's really hard because there are, in, there are incumbents who have a lot of capital and the capital is already deployed and they make revenue and profits from it. Uh, they either own toll roads or they own roads or they own, or their communities that have bridges or their utilities that operate the energy infrastructure. And just because the folks in this room might want to get something done doesn't mean the incumbent player uh, is on board with that. So we really have to reinvent 20th century partnerships to get that done. And these two acts are critical because of the rocket fuel to getting that done. Um, generally speaking, incumbents want to stall things from happening because if they stall things and put, put out forward the curve on which it's going to happen, they protect their revenue and their profits. So incumbents, generally speaking, thwart change by stalling, hindering, and delaying it. What we need to do now is, is put delay to the front line of, innov of innovation. And when we move to the front line of innovation, there's no end to what we can do because we have the capital, we have the markets, and we have the innovation. So the, 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 the laws uh, protect this. The three and the 10 are that left to their own devices, most of the markets will cause much of the big change to take 10 years. 10 years is not an acceptable number for anything. So in the law that um, the mayor is responsible for, He's got $85 billion for, for, for transmission lines in the United States of America. The $85 billion is not what they'll cost, but it's a really critical jumpstart rocket fuel towards getting that done. It takes, on average, 10 years for a transmission line to be built in the United States, from the idea to the time it's turned on. Given the overall goals in the both pieces of legislation, if it takes 10 years to get the transmission piece done, that's an utter failure. It's an utter failure. And the vested interests are, are embedded to try to cause that to happen. So the number three is that the number, is that all process that exists has to be thrown away. And the only thing that has to be optimized is getting it done in three years. So if we can move from 10 to three, we succeed. If we stay at 10, we don't. We have the opportunity to do it because we're doubling everything, and doubling gives you a fantastic opportunity to reinvent. And we now have, we know we have the market signals, and we definitely have the rocket fuel. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, terrific. Um, the next, the next, I'm gonna. I, this has stimulated uh, thoughts and questions uh, uh, quite a bit in my own mind. But I think this is the opportunity for people in the audience uh, who want to ask questions to participate as well. I'm pretty sure we have, we have a mic uh, here that, that is, is going to come uh, at some point, I hope. <laughs> and also there's people with uh, online, I can monitor uh, <laughs> online questions at the, at the same time. So if you could just wait one minute here, the mic will be coming over. Tell us who your question is directed to. Thank you, uh, Rick Ryback with Just Economics and the questions for the whole panel. Uh, Mayor Landrieu spoke about redesigning the infrastructure mousetrap, if you will. And I'm wondering what the panel thinks about what I call the infrastructure conundrum. Uh, typically, we build infrastructure, whether it's transportation, water, sewer, schools, what have you, to facilitate development. But if that infrastructure is well designed and well implemented, land prices near the infrastructure go up, and developers say, boy, I'd love to be next to the new infrastructure, but I can't afford those land prices. So they find cheaper, but more remote sites to develop. They develop the cornfield. People move into the cornfield, don't have the infrastructure they need. So politicians, being the good people they are, they extend the infrastructure of the cornfield, and the cycle repeats. And the resulting urban sprawl is not only bad for the environment, it's bad for our pocketbooks, because we duplicate these very expensive infrastructure systems compared to what we would need if development was more compact. And I'm just wondering if the panelists have come up with some uh, ideas about how to resolve this infrastructure conundrum so the infrastructure can 
better deliver the outcomes that it promises. I'm going to take that. <laughs> so, yes, I agree. There's a lot of, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your name, sir, but. Rick, I'm Rick too, yeah. So, so there's a lot of economics written on that, and the fundamental law of uh, traffic congestion is a paper in the American Economic Review by Duranton and Turner that I actually teach in my class. And if you just build new roads where the use of the road is not priced, it'll just become as congested as it was prior to the addition of the facility, the addition of the lane, and so forth. And they actually um, show how long it takes uh, before it gets back to the prior level of congestion. So uh, <laughs> self-serving, a, a paper with Peter Crampton, myself, and Axel Oakenfels is in Nature on uh, using real-time uh, network-wide road pricing to, to, to get to uh, free flow and avoid the sprawl. So a lot of the sprawl to an economist is because the fundamental input into taking a trip from A to B is, is the road space, which is the scarce input, is not accurately priced. But well, that would get us into a different uh, uh, area. Who wants to take the, this, Jim? I kind yeah, of, I'll, I kind of I'll, think that I'll is, take it is, on, is, uh, uh, maybe from a different perspective. And, different perspective. And, and I think uh, what we need to work on, I, I think, better in the transportation space is linking transportation decisions and land use decisions. So, uh, and, and that's difficult in some instances because some of those decisions are being made at different levels of government. Mm -hmm. So traditionally, it's been land use decisions have been more in the local domain. Uh, your major transportation dis decisions, especially from, the, from a road and highway bridge standpoint, are made more at the state level. And making sure that as localities are making land use decisions, they're being done in a way uh, that recognizes what type of transportation infrastructure will be able to support the land use decisions that are being made in certain areas. Uh, so I think that finding better ways to link those decisions together, making sure that localities have uh, a voice in, in the decisions that are being made from the transportation standpoint, and then also making sure that transportation agencies are at the table when some of these major land use decisions are being made, I think is, is an important uh, aspect uh, of this as well. I don't know if economics or even public policy decisions are going to solve uh, this conundrum that, that you've laid out here. But I think just better coordination uh, is, is going to help us make better decisions in the long run. I, I would add the following. Uh, we're at AEI today, and I think it's appropriate to uh, uh, pay deference to the pricing me mechanism, right? Uh, there, there is no free lunch. There's no free lunch for transit. There's no free lunch for airports. There's no free lunch for new highways or existing highways that require substantial capital investment. Uh, tolling has been a uh, up and down battle uh, in, in the United States. Obviously, the Northeast more tolled than other parts of, of the state. But applying the pricing mechanism, I think, together with, as Jim said, intelligent land use and transportation policy at the, at the state and, and federal levels, I think will contain sprawl, but at the same time give uh, Americans, including immigrants to the country, the ability to live. Uh, the type of lifestyle that they, uh, they want. But fundamentally, there's no free lunch. Uh, I'm going to advocate Jeff? for tolling for, for electrons. <laughs> okay? So, again, in the 20th century, because of the nature of population and energy systems, we, were divided, we divided the country into our IS, what are called ISOs and RSOs. They're service, service uh, sections of the country. And they're all physically divided by geography. Um, everyone, anyone who knows the country knows there's areas of dense population and areas, areas of, of, of concentrated population. And you also know that there's areas with natural resources and areas without natural resources. It turns out that in the 20th century, we took a lot of natural resources from under the ground, originally in Pennsylvania and subsequently in Oklahoma and Texas, and we distributed them. They're called oil to everybody. So the, so the idea of taking the, uh, the carbon and distributing it and charging for it in a regulated way is a 20th century idea. Now we want to take electrons and distribute them also. And electrons, um, they, they tried this in a small way in Texas, and it worked fabulously. Um, and Governor Perry was in part behind it, uh, because um, in the uh, early uh, aughts, um, there was a new technology called wind. There was a fabulous uh, natural resource in West Texas. It's very windy. 
It's the windiest part of the United States of America. The investors said, golly, we want to capture that wind. We're going to build a lot of wind turbines. And what did they lack in West Texas? Demand. They lacked markets. There were no people there. So then the people who had built all these wind turbines said, gosh, we got to get our electrons to the population centers. Where were the population centers they were focused on? They were, in, they were in East Texas. That's where Dallas and Houston, et cetera. So they built transmission lines in the state of Texas to move the electrons from one part of the state to the other. And it really stimulated fantastic stuff in the economy and, and it's made the energy mix, despite some of the more recent things, which are not because of that, more resilient and better priced. Now we have the opportunity in the 21st century to move electrons much further than from West Texas mm. to East Texas. And the only thing that's stopping it is policy and regulatory issues. So we can get around the policy and the regulatory issues. We can move the electrons from Texas and Iowa, where they're abundant, uh, to the East Coast and the West Coast. And that's about tolling and changing frameworks. So Rick, I do feel like I one of the things I try to do is give credit where credit is due. And the intellectual granddaddy of this was William Vickery from Columbia, who won a Nobel Prize in economics. He was the, the first, um, I don't know the first, but really the, the person who pushed the congestion pricing of, of Rhodes' idea and uh, uh, was recognized for having the vision of how this would work. He didn't know that you can measure movements through these things. He thought it would be under the car. He called it a whirly gig. I heard him speak about that. He <laughs> thought we meter road use under the car, and it turns out the technology is above the car with satellites and so forth in your cell phone. But anyway, his, and he kept push, got pushed back because of the technological problems at that time. This is many decades ago. Now that, that technological problem has been solved. And so I'd be curious to hear uh, if he could come back with us to hear what he would say. But other, other questions for the, for the group from, from the audience. This gentleman over here. Hi, uh, this is a question, I guess, for the whole panel. Can um, you identify yourself? Oh, yeah, uh, I'm an RA here at uh, Sam Owens. Um, during the stimulus under President Obama, he famously had this moment where he said he wanted to fund shovel-ready projects, and then he said later, there aren't quite any shovel-ready projects in America because we have this, you know, there's been a lot of commentary on it recently. We have this really extensive permitting and litigation process that, happen, that needs to happen before anything gets built. Um, and especially when you hear about all the money that's being spent um, and, you know, trying to double, like, our entire energy production in, like, a really quick period of time, I wonder about... I guess what I want to ask is, like, what would that landscape need to look like? Everything that happens, you know, all the paperwork that happens, the permitting, the litigation that happens before uh, shovels can go on the ground, what would that landscape need to look like to get stuff built, um, you know, on the schedules that, uh, that we're expecting? Great question. Um, maybe involves permitting, uh, but I uh, could take it anyway. Who wants to, who wants to field that? Well, I'll jump in because everything my firm does every day involves interconnection, involves permitting, involves environmental issues. I mean, you know, we, we really, so, so as practitioners, that's the most important thing. So, so there, there's several parts to answering the question, right? The first is we're all set up uh, around, around our federalist society, right? So all, most of the laws and structures that involve what needs to be done and what we're talking about are, are state and local laws, and they're not federal laws. Um, and and uh, we're not going to change that. Uh, that. That is how we're set up. So, so to get things done and to get everything done that they're talking about and I'm talking about takes a tremendous amount of, of change and innovation and flexibility at the state and local level. And, and there, by and large, isn't a way for the federal government to cause that to happen. They can encourage it. They can put money in, but they can't require it to happen. Um, and, that's, and, and that's a real set of challenges. So... You know, there, 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 there are some workarounds, and there, there, there's a bill out there on, on, on permitting, which is about permitting big things. And, you know, starts like that are, in, in a lot of people's views, really important, right? Because we've got we to break a lot of eggs and get, and get things to be done. When I go in to um, build solar farms uh, in rural communities, where I build a lot of them, uh, we're quite often the first enterprise who's ever uttered the word solar in that community. <laughs> And you know what's interesting is if you want to go in and build a building in almost any community in, in America, they know how to build buildings because there have been buildings forever, <coughs> right? So they have building codes, and they have laws and structures about what happens when you want to build a building. 
but they don't have codes for newer things, and they have to think about it. And, and the holistic thinking about it uh, is, is something that needs to be expedited and helped. The, um, the utilities um, who have to plug into every piece of electron, every electron that I'm talking about, and that the energy grid is talking about, the utilities are not used to having outside electrons plug into their grid, right? So they, so they, they also have to learn how to get along with the new electrons, and that's complicated, and that can be helped with federal policy. So I, I think it's a case of uh, Sherlock Holmes, the dog that didn't bark. And the dog that didn't bark is the airport that didn't get built, or the, uh, the dam that didn't get built, or the subway line extension in Manhattan up 2nd Avenue didn't get built, right? <laughs> and there are uh, huge societal and personal costs to those delays. The, the bill has uh, a couple of uh, provisions related to permitting, but I, I think there's probably more as a nation we can do. Uh, the bill contains a billion dollars of funding for permitting personnel <clears throat> at, at federal agencies, and it may include state agencies too. I'm not, I'm not sure about that piece. And it also properly incorporates environmental justice considerations in, in, into permitting. However, I think as a nation, uh, our environmental process or permitting process, to use uh, that, that, that term as Jeff did, uh, is a little um, excessive in some cases relative to the environmental process in countries like Canada and Australia and Germany and even the Nordic countries, all of whom care about the environment. And they want clean air and clean water, uh, as, as, as do we. And if you take into account the dog that didn't bark in the airport that didn't get built or the tax revenues that didn't get generated to pay for school teachers and the jobs that didn't create it, right? Th these are real drags on the economy. And I, I would suggest there's got to be a better, quicker way to do it. The, the other point I would make is the biggest burden, obstacle to any type of project is inertia, is time. Mm -hmm. The longer it goes, capital costs continue mm -hmm. to, uh, to increase, uh, and especially in a time of inflation, which we're obviously living in now, the cost of construction, the cost of the design, all, all will increase. So there's a real financial and social cost associated with that. So uh, a couple of things I want to mention. You, you talked about the, the 2008 uh, Act, the Stimulus Act, and, and the, the emphasis on shovel-ready projects. One of the things that a lot of people within the infrastructure community when Congress was debating the bill that we ended up with, the IIJA, was making sure that that wasn't the emphasis with this bill. I mean, the economy is at a different place now than it was in 2008. In 2008, there was a need to infuse dollars into the economy quickly, so there was this focus on shovel-ready projects. And as a result, you saw a lot of investments in what I would say like short-term benefits, right? You had a lot of resurfacing of, of roads, maintenance-type projects, because those are the ones that were easiest to get dollars out the door for to help stimulate the economy. We have an opportunity now to take a longer view with the dollars that we have in this bill. And as a result, I think you're gonna see a different type of impact on the economy, uh, on bigger projects, longer term vision for infrastructure, for the transportation network as a whole. And I think that will make a difference in a different way than what we needed in 2008. On the, on the speed of permitting and getting projects done, uh, what I would say is we are making progress. You know, going back even to you know, the, the transportation bill in, 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 20, in 2005, Safety Lou, uh, the FAST Act, uh, and now in this bill, there, there's been incremental progress in trying to speed up the delivery of transportation projects, but more can be done. Uh, I would say that states across the country have permitting processes in place that safeguard the environment but still allow projects that get built in, I would say, a more efficient way. There's not a state out there in the country that wants to harm their environments or that wants to uh, do harm to communities. I think we've learned a lot over the last 50, 60 years on the ways not to do it. Uh, so I think that there are places where we can allow the state process to stand in for the federal process and still get the same results but get them quicker. And focusing on bringing <coughs> communities into the discussion right. earlier, right. You know, there's a big focus in the state transportation community right now on making sure that we're community-centric, right? that we're building 
the projects that communities want us to build. If we bring communities into the process earlier, discuss what they're looking to get out of different projects, we can help smooth out some of the bumps in the road that we get throughout the project delivery process. So state DOTs are hearing that. You're seeing them take a more community-centric approach in what we do, and that should help us build projects faster and build the right projects. I guess, I'm, yeah, Jim, I'm so glad to hear sorry, that Jeff. transportation is making progress in permitting, because I will tell you in energy it's not. So we're, we're sitting here. There's still more progress to go. but There's a lot. <laughs> so we're sitting here in a section of the country which is called PJM, which is an acronym, but it, it's the better part of 12 states. It goes from the New York border to the North Carolina border. That's a lot of the country, and from the Atlantic Ocean to Illinois. That's a big rectangle in the middle of the country. Um, permitting renewable energy plants in that part of the country, which is 60% of GDP, is frozen for two years. It's frozen. You can't build a project in that part. That, that's a lot of the country. The fact that it's broken is because they don't have enough people or process to do permitting, and it's a badly broken problem which needs to be solved. And it, it's all about permitting. And, and Miss, uh, why don't we go, then, Denny, there's one question I want to get to online. But you first, Miss. If, and there's, uh, uh, the mic is right behind you. Thanks. Susan Ebner. Uh, we keep talking about these projects, and one of the things I want to talk about is how do we select the projects? Because I have not seen anything that lays out what's the system for assessing, what's the budget scoring for deciding a project goes or doesn't go, who gets it, et cetera. And I think we really need to talk about that as a basic because different states may have different priorities. Are those the priorities we want to fund? I'd like to hear some discussion yeah. about that. So I have to give a plug <laughs> for my dear friend and colleague, Don Kengo, who's the president of the Society for Benefit Cost Analysis. Out, <laughs> he was before. So there's a class on benefit cost analysis, and part of that is project evaluation. But, but Jim, I think the state, this is their value. Sure. So. Right, and, and what I would say is one of the great things about this bill that was passed is that uh, while it has a lot of big discretionary programs where the administration is going to be selecting projects based on the criteria that they lay out, the vast majority of the transportation dollars are still going to flow to state DOTs through formulas. And that will allow state DOTs to work with their local communities to identify the projects that they want to move forward based on what their own criteria are. Because you know, what is the right type of project to move forward in Idaho may be different than what's right to move forward in California or Texas or Florida or Minnesota. And this bill maintains that structure that has worked extremely well in the transportation community in the past. You're going to allow state DOTs to work with localities to set the priorities that best fit for those communities. And, and that's going to, I, I think, the, the right model for the federal program. This bill has a record amount of money that will go into the hands of US DOT and the federal government for them to be able to choose projects but there's still more than 80% of the transportation dollars are gonna to go to state DOTs by formula, and they're gonna be making those decisions uh, based on input from local communities. So Denny, hang tough. I wanna to read this question that's on my, my uh, computer here. Here's, I think it's quite good. With respect to workforce development nationwide with added emphasis on rural and tribal communities, any thoughts on changes slash improvements to the approach? Any thoughts on rethinking middle and high school students' curricula to revive appropriate vocation, vocational programs. Any thoughts on retur preparing returning citizens for infrastructure uh, careers well before they're released from incarceration? So we've talked a lot about workforce development that came up with the mayor. It's a theme. Uh, can we put some flesh on the bones? How, how, what policies might advance that? This is an important issue. Who wants to field that one? Well, the IRA legislation and in energy infrastructure has made it patently clear. So there's something called an investment tax credit, and the investment tax credit is 6% for the base project, and it's 30% plus 24 if you um, use prevailing wage and do workforce development. So that's a very large, so, so in, in, in that part of the law, the government has chosen to provide a very large economic incentive to using prevailing wage and workforce development. Uh, the rules still have to be written as to exactly what that means, but that, that will happen. So virtually every, uh, investor and developer in a renewable energy project is going to figure out how to make that happen. So there's going to there are going to be partnerships between so 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 the 
you know, I'm not in the workforce uh, um, uh, training business, uh, but, I, but I'm certainly going to find people who are and use them and use their people who are trained. So there's a, so there's a large economic incentive, um, and the markets will sort that out on that side. And it's totally different by state as to how that's going to happen. Yeah, I, I, I think the bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill got that right. And, and there is a focus on rural and tribal uh, areas. Uh, union apprentice programs, union apprentice mm -hmm. programs should not be overlooked. Vocational schools no. have a, a, a critical role. Uh, I, I think that uh, community colleges also play a, uh, a role, and there are incredible opportunities for well-paying careers uh, in construction and allied uh, fields that uh, hundreds of thousands of Americans will uh, take advantage of, I'm sure, over the next five years. Look, we've got workforce challenges, I think, at every level within the transportation community. And, and I think we've got to start at, at the very beginning, right? We've got to start with our STEM programs in, in our schools as well to make sure we're educating folks uh, to the value of, of, of learning more in, in math, uh, science, and engineering. Uh, we had an amazing speaker at our annual meeting last week down in, uh, in, in Orlando, uh, Dr. Calvin Mackey, who runs a, a STEM program in New Orleans. Uh, we have a, a program that we operate out of AASHTO, uh, the Track and Rides program that really focuses on getting state DOT engineers into uh, elementary, and middle, and high schools to be able to educate folks on the value of, of, of learning about science, math, and engineering. Uh, you mentioned, uh, or the questioner mentions uh, as well, how can we get uh, formerly incarcerated individuals back into the workforce and into society as well? There are state DOTs out there that are working with uh, nonprofits to be able to find ways to get folks mm -hmm. back into society with well-paying jobs around uh, everything from, from highway maintenance uh, in, in other areas so that we can find ways to address our workforce shortages but also get those folks kind of back into society in, in a well-productive way. Great, thank you. So my former master's student here, Denny Singh, has a question. Denny, your, your hand was up. There's a mic. Thank you, Rick. Um, so my question actually comes from Jeff, but it's for the whole panel. I understand that there's a lot of issues with uh, energy infrastructure, especially the paperwork and whatever goes through that. And they talk about having a circular uh, infrastructure, you know, where it's centralized. But that's not existent too. But taking your class and actually studying, there's a certain aversion in the US to P3s. Now, I don't mean that in just large projects. I mean local projects such as sanitation. I remember a contractor coming in and complaining, well, they, they look at me like I'm going to turn their water supply off. <laughs> Whereas what I was guessing is his revenue structure probably is, he probably makes money per liter of water that flows through the city. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how do you actually change that aversion to P3s at a state and local level mm -hmm. in the U.S. fast enough to keep up with this spending? <clears throat> Easy to throw money at a problem, tough to create the infrastructure. Now, I want to extend Denny's question, because I think he's right, but I think it varies across sectors. So there's like water. There's something about about water, you know, and and, the, and control of water that might be different, whether it's a private seaport or an airport. Maybe they don't care as much about that. But certain things like toll roads, like the P3 concessions for Indiana toll roads, Chicago Skyway, we discussed in class, so very very um, polarizing or intense reactions to those P3s. I don't know who, you know wants to uh, field that. Patrick, maybe this is for you, or Jim, you as well, I don't know. Well, look, uh, I, I, there, I think Denny's right. There is a sure. aversion in the United States that's kind of surprising given our, our free enterprise history. Um, what do you say? Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. <clears throat> and, and the history is interesting, right? If you look at transportation in the United States, in New York, Penn Station, Grand Central Terminal, the subways, the Hudson River, tunnels, the path, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Long Island Railroad, e even before that, right? So most of the capital for a growing United States in transportation and other areas was provided by, by private capital, uh, one. Two, P3s aren't for every solution, right? right? Uh, I built, my team and I built two bridges at the Port Authority, and I was there. One we did as a P3, which was Gothels. The other was raising the roadway of the Bayonne Bridge to allow larger ships to come under. We did one as a P3. The other was just a, a design, bid, build, deal. Uh, LaGuardia was a successful P3. Newark Terminal A, we decided to do, again, a different delivery method. I think we picked the right option for all. 
I, I think that um, my, my, my opinion, public-private partnerships where capital is being invested as opposed to providing services, there's an advantage to scale. There's an advantage to scale in terms of uh, capital, in terms of talent, in terms of sophistication. And when you get to really small projects, really small being $50 million or under or $25 million and under, the kind of transactional cost reality of P3, I'm not saying it can't be done, uh, but it, it becomes increasingly, increasingly difficult. So there, but there are different reasons to do a P3 as well, right? I mean, it's, it's not just on the financial side. It could be on the risk transfer side, right? I mean, there's a Port of Miami Tunnel Project, I think, is a great example of that. That's from an engineering standpoint. There were some risks there that these project sponsors weren't as comfortable taking on just on their own. They wanted to bring the private sector in to, pro to leverage their expertise and transfer some of that risk as well in order to get the project built out and to be able to do it in a partnership with the private sector from a finance standpoint, from a risk transfer standpoint. Uh, and it worked out great. And, and so there, whether it's, whether it's risk transfer, whether it's long-term maintenance and operations benefits from a P3, there are a lot of benefits that we don't talk as much about as we probably should. We keep getting tied into the financial aspects of it. Uh, we talk about uh, Lexus lanes and, and, and whatnot and, and the kind of some of the I would say the, 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 the negative commentary about it. But at the end of the day, a lot of these P3s are providing societal benefits, even if you're not using that system specifically. Mm -hmm. The benefits go beyond just the, the, the direct users, uh, whether it be reducing congestion for people that are using the free lanes associated with maybe a, a hot lane project, uh, or even just the demand management aspects mm -hmm. of some of these variable pricing facilities that are built with, uh, through, through P3s, uh, where you're able to, to charge higher rates for higher, uh, during the time of demand, and then maybe also change a bit of the behavior of the folks that are using those facilities. The, the prism that we looked at, uh, P3 opportunities at the port and at the MTA mm -hmm. was, one, uh, largely, is it, is it in the public interest of doing it? Are you going to get innovation that uh, you can't uh, get, that you can't obtain by doing it in the traditional manner? Ske schedule risk and, and, and budget risk, and passing those two risks to, to, to someone else uh, who will put you know, substantial equity at risk to, uh, uh, to make sure that happens. And as that someone else in the energy infrastructure side, the investors want above hurdle risk mitigated returns, period. <laughs> so every investor for everything has a hurdle and they want, to do, they want to achieve their hurdle in a risk mitigated way. So the nature of whether it's the public-private partnership or otherwise is about um, understanding the playing field, figuring out the timing, mitigating risk, and getting it done. Yeah, that transfer of risk or sharing of risk, there's a price to that, right? I mean, if you're going to transfer no free lunch, of it, like then Patrick it's, said, absolutely. no free lunch. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, I want to end with an apology, and that is there's a lot of good questions from the online people that we do not have time uh, to get to. But I do want to say thank you to everybody on the panel, as well as the mayor who had to run uh, a terrific conversation about infrastructure. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you very much.